Good afternoon and welcome to BizTech's ASEAN Midday Market Watch. Our guest today is Vishnu Varadhan, Head of Economics and Strategy at Mizuho Bank in Singapore. As always, great to welcome you on a Monday afternoon, uh, Vishnu. Not at all. You, you brighten my Mondays, Brian. So it's <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, before we start, let's take a quick look at how the regional exchanges are performing. Now, we're going to start uh, close to home with Bursa Malaysia, which is at 1,573.41. It's up 0.72%. The SGX is at 3,127.42. It's up 0.31%. Now, across the region, we've got Nikkei, which is at 28,388.72. It's up 0.25%. Shanghai Composite is at 3,492.04. It's up 0.16%. Bucking the trend is the Hang Seng, which is at 28,342.1, down 0.41%. The ASX 200 is up 0.22% at 7,046. And rounding off the numbers, we've got the Kospi, which is down 0.22% at 3,149. 3, now, Vishnu, what's the reason for the mixed market trading across the region? I think to start off, um, the 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 nice positive that we're seeing all around, almost all around, uh, it's, it's owed to the fact that US had a strong finish as well on, on Friday. So it was a, a, a concept of markets coming roaring back, people wanting to pick up risk and, and perhaps uh, get into uh, slightly better valuations after uh, the slippage that we've seen in, in the recent few sessions. Uh, but I, I think the theme remains quite consistent, which is, uh, th that it, it, it remains a mixed bag depending on how we, we want to look at this half full or half empty uh, situation in so far that we get better data coming out at certain places, uh, including US. In Asia, some of the supply side and, and, and the uh, uh, data are quite good with, uh, with industrial uh, you know, activity, so on and so forth. But the forward looking data are quite troublesome on, on two fronts. One is uh, we've got the resurgence of, resurgence of COVID uh, in, in Asia. So for Asia, that's, that's one of the things that's casting a shadow. And for the US, uh, the question of whether inflation then becomes a party pooper, uh, in, uh, especially if the Fed needs to react to it, that also becomes a, a bit of a question that hangs over the heads of investors for, uh, for the foreseeable few months to come. Okay, and Vishnu, I want to uh, zoom in on the areas of concern, particularly because of this gap that's widening between the US and the Asian outcomes. So, and we'll start with the pandemic itself and, and the vaccination. 44% of the US population has been vaccinated. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got Taiwan, which is in the low single digits. I think it's something like 3% or something like that. And then we have countries like Malaysia and all, uh, also at the low end of the spectrum. Is that really going to be a, a huge worry? Because Malaysia has just gone into a, a enhance the uh, lockdown, uh, but economic sectors are, are open because one of the key issues with many Asian economies is the fact that they've run out of policy tools to, to basically stimulate the economy uh, without uh, busting their budgets because Malaysia is a classic example of where they just cannot afford to close the economy. There isn't money in the tail in the kitty to spend on stimulus. So what are your thoughts on this? And maybe you could give us an, a, a regional outlook on how you see things panning out. Yeah, I mean, the pandemic is, is a good place to start. I mean, that is really the horse in this situation. We don't want to put the carriage ahead of it. Um, the increasing vaccine disparity leads us to one of two outcomes. It's between the devil and the deep blue sea. Uh, the devil, as you pointed out, is the divergence. Uh, and, and that devilish divergence tells us uh, that increasingly as this divergence persists, as to say if ASEAN and Asia do not catch up uh, with vaccinations and keeping cases under control, what that means is that uh, the delayed recovery that we are hoping for in 2022 is going to collide. It's going to collide with uh, uh, the, the US possibly starting to normalize policy, including taper. So therein lies uh, the first risk. The second risk, which is much more ominous, is, is uh, the longer the virus persists and, and is able to uh, you know, uh, replicate itself and, and have more mutations, uh, the vaccination becomes, uh, the, or, or rather the vaccination efficacy for even for countries with good rates uh, becomes more questionable. So we stay in this state uh, of, of limbo for a longer time. 
And that means the global economy gets dragged as a whole. So there are no good outcomes here. The question is, how quickly can Asia catch up in terms of vaccination and containment? And I think the three-pronged approach, which is very targeted containment, like you rightly pointed out, that doesn't take too much of a toll on economic sectors. That's one. Uh, so uh, you need to have very targeted con uh, containment uh, with very active testing and uh, in parallel vaccination being done, that could see Asia catching up sooner and hence the, the disparity between and the di uh, disparity and the consequent policy dissonance between the US and Asia may not be as extreme. Uh, but in, in any case, the two big challenges that Asia will still have to deal with are the very quick and rapid increase in costs despite yeah. COVID persisting, that's one, and B, the US's response to it, which may be taper. Uh, which then comes through in 2022. Uh, and, and that is uh, the, the big gap between the cost policy impact versus uh, the slower growth catch up because of uh, uh, the, you know, the vaccine lags. And, and Vishnu, this is, this is across the world. I mean, in the US, for example, so this, this whole inflation narrative, uh, the US, for example, and we take a very simple example of lumber because US houses are, you know, there's a lot of wood being used. Apparently, uh, and let's say that it could add the cost uh, of a house of up to 24,000 per new build. So that's a very significant part of the price of a new home. On the Asian side of the story, you have uh, you know economies like Malaysia and Singapore where steel bar prices have almost tripled. You know, and that's going to then flow into uh, inflationary pressures in the, the housing and construction industries. So. So that's, you know, how do you see this then? How do we get ourselves out of, out of the equation do you, in terms of how do then markets react um, to the situation, uh, especially in ASEAN? Well, my sense is, and, and here I'm, I'm being unusually and uncharacteristically optimistic about this, but my take on this uh, is that it is going, the reaction is going to be disappointment rather than panic. And, and let me explain there. So what we think could come across would be uh, disappointment in terms of the demand recovery. So you could have a slowdown in demand uh, because of the higher prices uh, acting as a headwind, as well as some demand substitution, you know, uh, uh, looking for alternatives that are maybe subpar, but alternative nevertheless, as well as, and here's the good news, some uh, supply response. So these things could come together to contain prices and allow for a uh, maybe not the optimal recovery, but slightly below that. Uh, and that's why we are looking at this as a, as, as a or we're not overly concerned about inflation risk because the, the primary thing here is uh, A, uh, it doesn't look like there's a demand uh, follow through there that would cause this to become a persistent inflationary problem. And B, monetary authorities are very well aware of this uh, current dilemma and so are likely to hold back on any policy response that might uh, be adverse to the recovery. So these two constellations as well as the demand supply responses uh, suggest to us that uh, this would be a period of discomfort and inconvenience, but it should start fade, fading depending on what kind of uh, cost push we're talking about in the 12 to 18 month horizon. Now, Vishnu, this is a data heavy and event heavy week. Um, what are the key data points and events that we should be looking out for that could move markets? Well, I, I think, uh, as, as you rightly pointed out, there are a lot of activity data that are coming out, but what we need to take into account is the fact that some of this may not fully capture uh, the downside risks to activity in Asia, uh, as well as the dilemma risks in the US and, 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 and in Europe. Uh, whereas I think the kind of communique that comes out of the Bank of Korea and Bank Indonesia might be interesting to watch uh, to see what the policy risks that uh, policymakers are concerned about uh, to, to varying degrees and, and, and given the various exposures. In particular for Indonesia, it is the downside risks to growth coupled with uh, debt monetization risk that uh, you know threatens the rupiah and, and, and stability and for korea how it's looking at its own fiscal uh, latitude versus the semiconductor boost that it might actually enjoy so yeah. having a, a sense of that would be quite important to us we also continue to watch oil prices quite closely because not because we're expecting huge swings but we think oil could be a stabilizer for inflation and for insofar that the recovery is back consistent with pre-covid levels not to multi-year highs so oil has got the biggest impact on inflation if it remains stable throughout this period i think then that would be an encouraging sign for us that uh, there is at least one stabilizing component to to the inflation risk story now Vishnu, as always thank you very much for your insights my pleasure
Now, we've been speaking to Vishnu Varadhan, Head of Economics and Strategy at Mizuho Bank in Singapore on Biznax ASEAN Midday Market Watch. I'm Brian Fernandez. Check out www.biznax.asia for business and technology conversations. Please don't forget to like or subscribe our Facebook and LinkedIn pages. Thank you very much for tuning in.